Happy New Year. All right. Glad you could, could be here with us this morning. I know we've got some that's sick and some maybe uh, partied a little bit too long last night. But uh, anyway, we'll certainly lift them up in our, our prayers so that God will bring healing to them. But um, first of all, I, I, I want to just ask for your um, bearing with me this morning. Uh, right now, I, I know I'm full of energy and, and I'm excited to be here, but uh, I'm still getting over being sleep deprived from Friday night with our student lock-in. Uh, I've learned over the last three to four years, I'm not able to recover from those like I used to. Um, you know, I, I don't know why I'm just getting younger every year, but, uh, but anyway, you know, just uh, bear with me if I start to, to drift off. Uh, just shout amen, give me a big, or big, or give God a big woo, or, you know, whatever. Uh, Psalms 149.3 says to, to dance for the Lord. So if you want to dance for him, something to, to kind of throw some fire back to me so that you can wake me up, feel free to do that, all right? And I'll, I promise I'll try not to fall asleep on you, which I'm sure that would be a first if I was to do that. But, um, but please, if I start to, to kind of lose... Uh, some thought or, or some energy, please uh, uh, forgive me for that. Um, so as, as many of us started the new year this morning, you know, a, lot, a lot of us kind of started out by looking back over 2016. You know, we kind of took inventory of the things that's happened, some good, some bad, some just, may just be okay, um, Maybe just some average things. Uh, maybe you, you started giving thanks to God for the things that He has given you. You know, I, I don't know if any of you read um, my uh, Daily Bread uh, this morning, but uh, as I was was reading that, after I got up this morning, uh, there was this lady who started this here little jar of of praise thanks, and I can't remember exactly what she called the jar um, that had thank thanks in it and praise, um, I, I believe. But as she went through the year, every day she dropped a praise of what God had done for her that day in the jar. And then at the end of the year, she, she started pulling them out. I mean, maybe you've, you've done something like that, uh, gone back through your journal and, and did that. But then also, as we kind of look back over the past year and things that's happened, we kind of look toward 2017 in anticipation of the things that is to come. But you know, as I was thinking about that and, and was studying what God had, had kind of laid on my heart this morning, I kind of started thinking back about what New Year Day really meant. You know, I, I mean... What significance does it have in our life? I mean, we know that it's, it's the beginning of a new year, but what about us as believers? What significance does it have other than us looking back over and, and giving God thanks for what he's done and looking toward anticipation for what he's going to do? Do you even know when New Year's Day began and why it began? The very first New Year's Day began 4,000 years ago, and it was uh, started by the Babylonians. And they started it as a religious practice. Uh, it was actually, the name of, of the celebration was called Akutu. Akutu was, was basically this religious celebration of the mythical victory of the Babylonian sky god, Marduk over the evil sea goddess Tiamat, and it served a very important political purpose also. See, that was a time that whenever they had a new a ruler that was coming uh, in to, to take over the kingdom or, or to take over the government, they were installed on that very day. Or if it was someone who was uh, having to renew um, their uh, dedication um, toward the position again, they did the renewal then. But throughout time, as civilization, as civilization has uh, gone on and, and 
uh, different cultures have kind of started their own calendars and everything. Around about B.C. 46, Emperor Julius Caesar created what is called the Julian calendar. And it was very much like the um, Gregorian calendar that we use today. And, and he set up January the 1st as the very first day of the beginning of their year. And January was actually uh, named after Janus, which was their god, the god of the beginning uh, that they worship. And it was a, a tribute to him. But their uh, god Janus uh, was actually a two-faced god that they worshipped. See, he could look back in the past while at the same time looking forward into the future. And, and so, hence, that's kind of where some of our, our tradition for New Year's Day has came from. But what significance does that have for us as believers? Now, last week, Pastor Chris kind of uh, mentioned a, a verse that kind of alludes to why we worship or why we celebrate New Year's Day as, as Christians or why we should. Uh, you see, over in uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 21, it says, And when eight days had passed before his circumcision, his name was then called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the, room, in the womb. So you see, as we take and we uh, have December the 25th, which is what um, the Christian church before us has uh, dedicated as the birth of Jesus Christ of when we celebrate it, if you count eight days afterwards, you're on January the 1st. As we look at this verse, we see that there was something significant that happened to Jesus Christ. First of all, he was never named, and so he was named on this day. And secondly, the first act of, of sacrifice after his birth was done on that day. It was his circumcision. So from there, that's where the, the church started, um, started uh, celebrating New Year's Day. I know we, we don't really celebrate it in that way as much now as, as what they used to. But that's just kind of the, the meaning and the significance behind some of, of why we celebrate New Year's Day. And so as we, we take and, and look at our scripture today that I want us to, to kind of focus on, Paul kind of takes us back. So kind of what New Year's Day means. Going from the old to the new. If you have your Bibles, if you would, turn uh, with me to Ephesians chapter 4, verses uh, 17 through uh, 24. And if you would, please stand. And, and while you're, you're turning and standing, I'm going to be reading from the uh, New, Living Transver um, New Living Translation this morning. All right, um, just because of, of the way that it puts it a little bit, um, I just kind of like how it kind of explains it uh, just a little better than, than the um, ESV version I normally use. And it says, With the Lord's authority I say this, Live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and harden their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. But that isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come to you this morning, Father, we thank you for your word and how it speaks to specific uh, times in our life, Father. And Father, especially this morning as we come to uh, celebrate your word uh, of going from the old to the new. And Father, as we've just celebrated 
our New Year's, Father, leaving one year and going into another, a fresh start within our, our lives, Father. We just pray that your word would speak to us, speak to us individually, and, and Father, just burden our hearts where you would have us to be burdened so that we could go forth and let others know about your true love and the truth that you stand for. For it's in your name we ask these things. Amen. Back in, in 2006, and some of you may recall a, a TV show that was on HGTV, and it was called Junk Brothers. Uh, I mean, I kind of enjoyed watching Junk Brothers from time to time, and occasionally whenever it still comes on, I, I still enjoy watching it. But uh, their purpose was that they would go out into town and into these neighborhoods, and they would look uh, for uh, items that residents were throwing away. And they would be sitting out near the curb, and so they'd drive up, and, and they'd uh, pick them up, and they would take them back to their shop or uh, wherever they would, would actually go so that they could, um, could kind of make a new creation out of them. I mean, they, they'd take them back, and they would repurpose it. And then at the end of, of them having it repurposed, they get it finished, they uh, take it back to the original owners. And, and they go up and they deliver it to them and, and they record their expression whenever they find out that what they've done is they've collected an old item that they had sitting out beside the road and they've repurposed it, turned it into uh, maybe some furniture, some appliances, or, or maybe even some artwork. But as I, I, I thought about that show, it kind of reminds us of how we are, uh, of what Paul is, is talking about uh, in our scripture here today. You see, God takes our old sinful life and changes us and remolds us into something new and useful for his glory. See, God doesn't make a new you. He just takes and he changes your attitude and, and who you are. It's almost like us taking maybe one of these uh, doors here, okay? The purpose of that door is to let us in and out and keep the, the weather out and uh, to provide a, a sense of security for us. But if we were to take one of those doors and, and repurpose it maybe into a, a coffee table or something, I mean, it doesn't change the fact that it was a door. I mean, it's still a door, but it just has a new purpose now. And that's what God does, does with us, is he takes and he, he makes us into something useful and, and for his purpose. And so that's what Paul is talking about in uh, the first uh, three verses there in 17 through 19. He says, do not live as the Gentiles live. Paul is reminding us of, a pre of the previous life of a non-believer. See, over in Ephesians 2, uh, verses one, and, 1 through 3 there. It says, And when you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. You see, we were dead in Christ uh, while we were in our disobedience and sins against uh, God. As non-believers, we carried on just like any other non-believer was carrying on in, in that day. Um, you know, we were basically a pawn of Satan and his demons, carrying out our, his cause, all right? uh, doing things for his glory, taking care of his agendas. And we all did these things unaware that Satan had total control over us because we were blinded by the influences of this world. Or, as I may say a little bit on, as the culture of this world. See, you and I both at some time in our life has lived under the control of Satan, and we didn't even know it. But thank God that because of what Jesus Christ done on that cross for us, all right, we no longer have to live under the rule of Satan. All right, we are now able to, to take in and give glory to God and, and live for His glory and carry out 
his purpose that he has for each of us. And Paul will, will actually address how we do that uh, within our, our text here in, in just a little bit. But as Paul begins his teaching to the church here in Ephesus, here in our passage, he lets us know that he is not speaking on his own authority, but he is speaking through the authority of God, with the Lord's authority is what he says. And Paul often uses these words when he wants to, to bring some attention to what he's about to say, to let you know that, that hey, this isn't just his words, just him speaking, these are actually words that God has given him and has given him the authority to speak to his people, the church of, of Ephesus there as he's uh, talking to them. So I want us to kind of unpack these two verses here um, just a little bit because there's several things that um, Paul brings out um, within this. Uh, the first one is Paul says, live no longer. I mean, here is a demand that a believer is, is to have a major and radical change in their lives because he's telling us don't live any longer as those Gentiles do. Don't live any longer as you used to. Uh, live as a changed person. Uh, start living for the glory of God. Die to self and live in Christ. The other thing that he deals with here is our relationship as believers and how we should relate to this world. See, we once lived as part of this world, but once we become believers, then, then we leave that world. In that world, we were separated and we were strangers in the kingdom of God. But whenever we take and we become a child of God, we now go to the other side and we are not in this world. We are now strangers and just uh, pilgrims in this world. Because now we are citizens of heaven. And Paul also wants um, to address us with the culture in which they were living at that time and in which the times that we live. See, while the Ephesians believers once lived as their counterparts, um, he knew that, that they would continue to have some peers that continued to live in the culture that they were in, within the lifestyle that they wouldn't make any of that change that they would carry on in their own ways. And so just as you and I know in our walk with Jesus Christ is that it's not easy when we're around a lot of people who are non-believers. I mean, have you ever tried to uh, just have a spiritual conversation with somebody who is a non-believer? I mean, as you're sitting there and, and they maybe one of the things they say is, you know, I just can't understand how a loving God could just punish a, a small child the way that he does sometimes. You know, may, they've got a, a terrible disease. But you know why? As you're sitting there and you're, you're talking to them and, and you let them know that the reason that child has that disease is not something that God done. God created us perfect. It's because of man himself taking and, and um, messing up a, a good thing, the perfect thing that God had created, and it's because of man's sin that is, is brought disease and, and, um, and stuff into the world. Brought sin into the world. And so as you're sitting there and, and you're trying to explain it, and, and you think it's just clear as day that, that the light bulb should come on, I mean, it never comes on. That's because they're not in the world uh, uh, that we live in, in, in as Christ because we are heaven citizens. They are of the world. They don't understand it. And so Paul, Paul knows that, that they're going to have a struggle with that. Um, and then he also addresses the relationship with the culture that they will... Um, I'm sorry. He addresses our conduct and the consequences of our mental uh, processes also. What we believe will always affect the way that we behave. You know, Paul characterizes the lifestyle of the non-believers that were living in Ephesus and in the culture that they were living in uh, then. He says that they are hopelessly confused, or as the ESV version puts it, futilely of their minds. 
See, these are their efforts that did not materialize into something worthwhile. They were futile because they did not have any lasting or internal or eternal significance. You know, this takes us to the very foundation of man's thinking, the theorization of which we base our thoughts on, that determine what the results of our thoughts will be. And an example of this, this is one that I, I shared with you. But also, um, as as we're on the way to church this morning. Uh, my wife and I were, were talking about some of the things that is, is now starting to take place within our, our college and our universities now. I mean, I don't know if, if you've stopped and kind of looked at um, some of the, the courses that they're starting to, to teach, but they're starting to teach um, things uh, that uh, basically push the agenda uh, of accepting gay marriages or accepting homosexuality. I mean, they're, they're pushing these courses. And some of the other things that they're starting to do, um, you know, that, that whenever uh, it was, was time for us to go, I mean, a lot of times we didn't have to go in and, and know the exact thing that we were going for. I mean, you could go in and, and just take some general classes, but now, before you ever go, you have to know the major that you're going in. Because they want to push you and, and, and form your thoughts for that one major that you're going in. See, they don't want us thinking anymore. They want to tell you how you're supposed to think. And that's one of the tricks that Satan uses. It is trying to, to teach us that this is the way. And because of that, I've um, been reading where, where there are some uh, companies who are now starting to not to want college graduates because of that. Because they've been programmed a certain way. And the way that they're wanting them is not to be programmed, but so that they can teach them the correct way of, of how they want their businesses run. Now, unbelievers' hearts are hardened and their minds are closed. The heart and mind of the unbeliever are closely intertwined. This keeps them from seeing things as they really are. Now, Ephesians 6.12 uh, tells us, For we do not re wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. See, that's what we have to remember as we're talking to these folks who are non-believers, is that, that we're, we're not wrestling against them. We're wrestling against Satan and his demons, his demonic powers. And... and and you see, I mean, we can't take it personally whenever, whenever we're attacked by these folks. It's because they don't know the truth of Christ. I mean, they live within this world. We're fighting against the powers of Satan. And it's all because our fellow man is still in the darkness and under Satan's controls. They are mentally blinded, and those who are mentally blinded become morally callous and we can see that in our culture today about how everybody is becoming morally callous in our culture I mean they lose any sensitivity to what is right or what is wrong they have given themselves over to the pursuits of fleshly desires and then Paul goes on there in, in verses 20 and 21 says, but this isn't what you learned about Christ since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him. You know, Paul here begins to transition from culture to the flesh, from external influence to, etern to internal influence. He tells his audience there at, at Ephesus that what he is now teaching them is not something new that they haven't heard. I mean, be before we ever became a child of Christ, I mean, we probably have heard the Word of God taught to us. I mean, some of us ha have grown up you know, under church leadership, under the teachings of the church. Some may not. And Paul knew that there were probably some folks there that, that may not have even heard. But as he, he makes that transition, he lets them know that 
hey, you've been taught about Christ. And you've heard about Jesus and you've learned the truth that has come from Him. Because this is, is after Jesus Christ has come and died on the cross. All right? and, and there's eyewitnesses of stuff that has happened. There's some of them that may have set up under the teaching of Jesus Christ. So he, he's telling them that they have heard it. I mean, Paul is basically just right up in their grill here. I mean, he's letting them know that he's giving it straight to them. And what he's teaching them, they've already have heard. And it's still the same as it was when Jesus Christ was speaking it. You know, it's just like whenever we must discipline our children. I mean, we know that we, we've taught them right from wrong. From day one. But whenever you're giving that punishment out to them, all right, oftentimes they're reminded that they've been taught right from wrong. I mean, a lot of times it's you knew better than to do that. I mean, that's letting them know that, hey, I, I taught you different from that. And that's what Paul is, is telling us uh, right there is, is that they know what is right and what is wrong, and they have no excuse to still live their life in hopeless confusion and darkness as the other Gentiles were. See, before you can escape from the hardness and darkness of the old life, you have to hear the voice of Jesus and respond to his voice and allow him to teach you as a trusted master. His voice breaks through all the confusion and the darkness and ignorance and awakens you from the hopelessness of death. And the response of the faith that you put in him saves you from the confusion and hopelessness and selfish and self-destruction. And you just say, Lord, save me. But let's be clear. You must allow him to save you. And you must allow him to have control of your life before you can apply any of this message to your life today. You must listen for Jesus calling you out of darkness and into the light and out of death into life. Luke 8, 18 says, take care then how you hear. Mark 4, 23 says, if anyone has an ear to hear, let him hear. See, once you hear the voice of Jesus just as Paul says there in verse 21, be taught in the truth that comes from Jesus. Jesus just is a teacher. He is truth. And, and then over in John 14, 6, Jesus says this, I am the way the, and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. See, Jesus is claiming his truth, that he is truth. And to come to him is to come from death to life, from condemnation to justification, from sin to sanctification, from ignorance to true wisdom. You can't just come to Jesus without changing your thinking. That's what true repentance is all about. The life that a believer should live should be no surprise. And Paul, here in the text, sets out God's standards for believers. Verses 22 and 24. Excuse me, 22 through 24. Throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holiness. See, Paul continues to point out the connection between our conversion to Christ and our conduct to Christ. That should be evident in each and every one of our lives. Jesus warns us about the dangers of striving to remove evil and without placing it. In fact, in Luke 11, verses 24 through 26, To become a new person, that new person is made to be like God, made to be true, truly good and holy. I'm sorry, Luke 11, Luke 11, 24 through 26. I'm sorry, I'm behind you.
Okay, it says, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, and finding none, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits, more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of the person is worse than the first. So right there, uh, Jesus himself is telling us that, hey, it's not just enough to reject those, those evil spirits, to reject those things, because as they leave and they go out and they have no other place to go, they're going to come back and it's going to be game on again. And it's going to be stronger because it says he's going to find seven more spirits, more evil than itself, to come and take place back in you. So you see, when we get rid of, of those evil things, we have to be sure to replace it with something so that whenever those spirits leave us, they can't come back into us. Um, how, do re, how do you replace a bad habit? You replace it with a good habit, right? One of the ways to, to get rid of, of those sins in your life is, is to replace it with the very Word of God right here. I mean, you want to change your life, you want to get rid of sin out of your life, this word right here breathes its very nature into you when you read it and you study it and you meditate on it. You're replacing those evil things that Satan is tempting us with. Paul's words also suggest that our nature is not just to be rejected but to be replaced. We must put off the old nature and put on the new nature. While the old nature is continually um, corrupt and, and um, being uh, full of lust and deceit, the new nature is renewing us within. It is making us into the nature of God and His righteousness and His truth. The old is deceitful. The new deals in truth. The old is sinful. The new is righteousness. The old is driven by lust but the new is driven by the character and purposes of God. See, Christ did not save us in order for us to choose the way we may live. He saved us to live a godly life and in a way that is extremely different from the culture of the unbelievers around us. We should strive as Paul urges us in Ephesians 1. Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. So, so this text and those that even follow in the Ephesians clearly con convey that salvation and sanctification are the work of God, but they require man's response. God is faithful to those he has chosen who willfully follow him. The believer's lifestyle cannot be lived out by those of a pagan mindset. Our pagan culture believes that the past is key to the present. What we think and how we act is the result of our past is what the culture teaches us. In other words, they say the past controls the present. But whenever we read God's word, we see the reverse of it. Paul told us that our past was due to unregenerate thinking. He says that what we now are in Christ is what should override and overrule our past thinking and our past behaviors. Our past should not be resurrected, analyzed, or dwelt on. It should be buried in the grave with the old nature. It's not what we were that matters. It's what we are. Paul goes on in verses 25 through 29 there and gives some examples. Uh, specific changes all right, that we as believers should, should, uh, should uh, take up. All right, but I'm not going to go through, through those, but I do want us to look at verse 30 there. It says, And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, He has identified you as His own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. All right, so... Paul is telling us there not to bring sorrow into God's Holy Spirit by the way that we live. Do you not know that your actions are actually a reflection of others and 
through uh, organizations that you actually represent. Um, you know, often from time to time, I, I'll remind our, our teens as we're going out and we're uh, doing activities away from the church, I often ask them, do you know who you're going to represent on this trip? Some of the things that we represent is our group. They are a direct ref, uh, reflection of our group. They're a reflection of their leaders. They're a reflection of this church and what it stands for. They're a reflection of the church leadership. They're also a reflection of their peers, of their parents, their family, and the list can go on and on and on. But the most important reflection that they reflect is the reflection of Jesus Christ. You know, and you and I are the very same. Whenever we go out and, and we're out in the world, we're not only a representation of Jesus Christ, but you're a representation of Faymont Baptist Church. You're a representation of, of your parents and your family. You're also a representation of, of the folks that you work for, your friends, your co-workers. So how well are you representing your peers? How well are you representing your family? How well are you representing your parents? How well are you representing Faymont Baptist Church? But the most important question to you this morning is, how well are you representing Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior? This morning, if you hadn't had a chance to remove that old nature, then this altar will be open and you'll have a chance to come and take off the old and put on the new. The newness that that Jesus Christ gives us. Or maybe you've taken that step. But you, you may still be living as some of these Gentiles that Paul was talking about. That He was telling them that, that they should know better. That even though they They've taken that first step of change, but they really hadn't gotten rid of the culture. The culture is still within them. Maybe that's one of the decisions that you need to make this morning. So as Tim comes, this altar is going to be open. And you just respond how, how you feel, whether it's one of those, those two things, or, or, or maybe um, God's laid somebody on your heart and, and he wants you to come and, and lift them up to him. Or maybe even you've been thinking about joining Faymont Baptist Church then we invite you to come down and take that step this morning to, to become a part of this family. To say, hey, I don't only want to, to represent God. I want to be a representation of, of a bigger body also. I want to be a member of that body that Jesus talks about that it takes many to make. For we all make up that one body. If you would just please stand. Bow your heads, close your eyes. This altar is open. Are you responding how, how God leads you this morning?